Bismillah walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu wa rasulullah Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ahdahu la shirika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Welcome back to another session in which we are refuting online Christian apologists And in today we have something uh, quite unique uh, in our endeavors uh, to refute Is we have an ex-Muslim who has made a video on why he has left Islam uh, a guy who says he's been Muslim for over 16 years and recently he could not uh, find refutations for accusations that was made against the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he had to leave uh, in this video he's going to explain one particular point and this is I guess the major reason why he left Islam we're going to look at this reason look at his explanation and dissect it and refute it uh, his video is about 9 minutes and uh, 30 seconds long um, we, know, we won't watch all of it but we have to go through each section um, to dissect it and refute uh, as many points as we possibly can so we are mentioning in the outset that this video that we're doing may have some length to it but we ask for your patience and stay with it as we refute this guy entirely let us play him as we do our normal refutations. Let us hear his claim and then let us bring our proof and evidence against him to refute him clearly. Bismillah. Hello, peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Brother Ismail. I've been a Muslim for 16 years. But in the past few years, I have been bothered by some reoccurring issues which have forced me to question my Islamic faith. And recently I have decided to finally leave Islam and in this video I will explain why. Okay, so this video will explain why he left Islam um, and um, this is what we're going to um, dissect and see. In fact, is this the reason why he left Islam? Is there some other agenda here that this guy has? Uh, was he ever really Muslim? Uh, we, we believe so. He's been online for some time now. So many Muslims have testified to the fact uh, that he was a Muslim and he had been making um, videos in uh, defense of Islam uh, but Allah knows uh, what the true intention was over that time period nonetheless let us examine his explanation let us refute it and let us move on we're gonna go to the next uh, point he starts about right here uh, which is going to talk about um, a laws to find the responses to refute the things that uh, that troubled him. Islam. Now let me address the title of this video, the question, Why I Left Islam. The answer to this question is the Quran and Muhammad and their teachings on moral standards and conduct. You see, over the past few years, I have found that I am no longer able to defend the Quran and especially Muhammad's Moral, morals and conduct. In the past, I have done my best to defend Islam, and in particular to defend Muhammad from the claims and charges made against him. I tried my best to love Muhammad, and I can prove I stood up for him and defended him many times. For example, I produced videos like Was Muhammad Merciful? where I tried to pr provide examples of Muhammad's good character and my video, Who Are the Islam Haters?, where I tried to refute and expose the anti-Islamic critics, and I made many more videos in which I defended Islam and Muhammad. Most of the time I was successful in defending Muhammad against those who were attacking his character, as I was well educated in Islam and I studied Islamic apologetics for years. Okay, this is an interesting point here because he considered himself to be well educated in Islam, and he studied uh, Muslim apologetics for years, but yet he says that uh, he could not find refutations against the accusations that was made that he's going to bring, which is quite surprising because these refutations are quite easily uh, accessible and there in the books uh, for those who understand and have read them. So uh, this claim he's making really casts a big shadow of doubt 
on his sincerity and on this point also is that he said he continues he said he tried to he tried to he tried to uh, if you have firm conviction in your heart and you understand uh, the truth of Islam then it's not a matter of trying uh, to defend and trying to love the Prophet and trying to be sincere no it becomes natural because you realize that this is the truth so the fact that he's trying to do something uh, is indicative that maybe true Iman has not settled in his heart true faith has not settled in his heart and this is the reason why he's trying maybe he's trying to believe when he never really believed in the first place um, and this is maybe why he have this um, this decision to leave quote unquote Islam now let's continue however while I was defending Islam I have noticed I had noticed many of the criticisms were actually valid and based on authentic early Islamic sources okay quickly uh, the criticisms that came uh, were valid and they were based on Islamic sources uh, no one will doubt that people can look into the Islamic sources and make critiques that doesn't mean that there's no refutation for those critiques and explanation for them when the people um, need to have them um, explained so just because they're there and authentic does not mean that somehow it undermines or detracts or make Islam to be untrue and I found myself at a loss to find adequate, honest responses to them. In the Again, he had at a loss to find adequate uh, responses to them. Yet he said that he was very learned in Islam and he's been studying uh, Islamic apologetics. So we, the question has to be asked, if you are very learned in Islam and you have been studying Christ, I mean, uh, Muslim apologetics, how is it possible for you not to find these refutations of these uh, accusations that came up against Islam? Uh, this is a question that we would like for him to answer. And we would, we, we're going to reach out to this gentleman and offer him this video and ask him to watch the video and see his points refuted and see where his comeback is. This is our challenge to him once we finish this video and upload it, inshallah. Now let's continue. Coming videos, I shall share with you many of the allegations made against the Quran and Muhammad that I could no longer defend. But for the sake of brevity, in this video I will provide you with one example on the topic of sexual immorality. As shocking as it may seem, both the Quran and Muhammad teach that it's permissible, halal, to capture and rape female war captives. If okay, stop here. So he's making a very specific statement here, and he's saying that both the Quran and the Hadith teach that it's permissible to capture and rape war captives. This is the claim he's making against Islam. This is what he's saying, and he said it emphatically. So this is what we're going to bring and examine and refute. And let's see uh, how this goes uh, for this guy. Because this is a clear lie. And at the end of everything as we go through, we're going to list some points, list our proof, look at various uh, aspects of this um, accusations he make with the proof necessary to refute, him, to refute him completely. When we've done this video, he will be refuted 100% on what he just posted here. Inshallah. Let's continue. Even if these women are married and their non-Muslim husbands are still alive. So let's investigate the Islamic sources to see what they say. The Quran in chapter 4 verses 22 and 23 informs Muslim men about the categories of women which they are forbidden to marry. But in ayah number 24 we read, Well muhsanatu minan nisa'i illa ma malakat aymanukum. Also forbidden are women already married except those whom your right hands possess. So we see here in the Quran an exception, an example where it is permissible, halal, for a Muslim man to marry a woman who already has a husband. But who are these women? Okay, let's stop here. Uh, again, we are taking his claims on face value the gentleman said that he had uh, extensive knowledge in Islam and he was well educated in apologetics, Muslim apologetics. Um, first and foremost, this ayat, and he's going to cover the tafsir of the ayat as well as the hadith, which are authentic and we accept it with no problem. The point he misses is that when you're studying uh, ahkam, when you're studying rules uh, of uh, various aspects of Islam, you have to go into the books of fiqh.
You have to go into the books of Usul and understand it's not sufficient just to go into the tafsir or go into the hadith. Because oftentimes the, the tafsir and the hadith are not fiqh based. Their rulings are not brought out from just reading the tafsir or the hadith. You have to go into the books of fiqh and get those positions from the fuqaha on these particular issues. And it is written clearly in the books of fiqh that whenever a female captive is taken automatically the divorce uh, the, uh, the marriage she had with their uh, current husband is annulled if a man went to war against the Muslims and his wife was amongst the war uh, spoils that man and that woman once they become captives are automatically divorced she's taken as a captive he may be taken as a captive he may be killed Whatever the case is, this is not the issue here, but the, the the wedding, the marriage is automatically annulled. They are not no longer they are no longer married. They are no longer married. This is the position of the condition when a woman is taken captive. So the ayah is coming down to mention that these women are permissible. Why? Because once you take them captive, automatically they become divorced from their husband. He didn't mention that. He didn't hint to that. He didn't indicate anything of this nature. Why? Because he knows that this would crush his whole argument. Let us continue. Women described as being owned or possessed by your right hand. For the answer, let us turn to the most famous commentator on the Quran, Ibn Kathir who, while commenting on Quran chapter 4, 24, said the following, quote, Allah said, وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ Also forbidden are women already married except those whom your right hands possess. The ayah means you are prohibited from marrying women who are already married. إِلَّا مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ except those whom your right hands possess, meaning, except those whom you acquire through war. For you are allowed such women after making sure they are not pregnant. Imam Ah. Okay, stop here. Now, he's mentioning after making sure they're not pregnant. Uh, and he's going to mention this in the tafsir, but he doesn't mention it himself. Is that there's an idda period. There's an idda period. There's a waiting period. Uh, for cases like this which also shows that these men were not just taking these women off the battlefield and going and having sex with them this is the indication or implication that he's trying to give that somehow the man the Muslim soldier took this woman off the battlefield and immediately engaged in her uh, sexually against her own wishes and will and the like um, so, I mean, he's drawing up a fabrication and hyping it so high that when you hear it, of course, you're just, you know, just, uh, it's become distasteful. You, 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 anyone would not accept such a, such a case. But this is far from being the reality of what happened on the battlefield at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let him finish and then we're going to finish up our point uh, refuting it. Ahmed recorded that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, We captured some women from the area of Al-Tas, who were already married, and we disliked having sexual relations with them because they already had husbands. So we asked the Prophet about this matter, and this ayah was revealed. وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ Also forbidden are women already married, except those whom your right hands possess. Consequently, we had sexual relations with these women. This is the recording collected by At-Tirmidhi, and nasai Ibn Jarir, and Muslim in his Sahih. And this hadith is Sahih. This hadith is Sahih. And again, there's no problem with this because when you go into the explanation and understanding of this ayat, as it applied to the Sahaba at that time, then they were allowed to take on the captives from on the spoils of war. Now there are conditions with taking captives, there's conditions with dealing with captives uh, and the like. 
but what he is implying is somehow that these men took these women they had husbands there and they went and they had sex with them almost in front of their husbands the impression he's giving which is a complete lie again first and foremost once a female is taken captive then the marriage between her and her husband is annulled it's cancelled it's voided automatically second of all she has to wait at least a month's period um, to verify she has it that to verify first and foremost that there are no children involved and why is that important if this was a matter of just sex alone then there would be no need to wait at that period and to verify that there's no children involved because who cares if you're just taking the woman as a pleasure for sex so this shows that there is responsibility that's going to assume and no one wants to be responsible for a child that doesn't belong to them so there's a, at that period there's a waiting period next is that you, after the waiting period the woman she has to consent she has to consent to any kind of intimacy she has to give consent and if she gives consent then she's permissible for you and she begins to obtain the status of a wife although she doesn't have the same right because she's not free because she's a captive she still obtains and receives the same benefits as a wife she must be maintained she must be provided for she must be fed she must be clothed and all the things like that so because uh, she consented to sexual intercourse then she becomes a, a right hand possession but she has a status of a wife if she does not consent then that man in no way can force himself upon her he cannot have sex with her and if he does as we're going to see later then it is a crime he must give her a compensation fi uh, financially and the uh, application of the HUD for adultery is applied on the man none of this this guy mentions none of this yet this is the detail of what happens in these kind of situations why didn't he mention it did he not know about it and if he didn't know about it and now for the first time he's learning about it then again in our challenge to him we challenge him to examine the proofs as we're going to see and recant and make a video to apologize for his lies and misrepresentation of Islam let him finish now at this point, maybe you're in a state of shock. Maybe you're even saying to yourself, this is impossible. The glorious Quran and the noble Prophet Muhammad would never teach such sexual immorality. Or maybe you're thinking, there must be some other more positive interpretation to the Quran, chapter four, verse 24. Or maybe you're even trying to convince yourself that the great Islamic scholar and the most famous Quran commentator Ibn Kathir is completely wrong and he has no idea what he's talking about. Brothers and sisters, I wish all of that were true, but unfortunately when we investigate the matter further, things just get worse. Okay, now let's stop here. So he's in, uh, implying that uh, all of this is not true and that the Quran has serious gross moral teachings as relates to uh, female captives. Let us begin now to look at some source text, some proofs, um, Dalil, to show just first and foremost the treatment of captives, first and foremost, and then after that let's look at the, um, the rulings from our ulama on the position of female captives. Uh, so let us just go, we're going to peruse some ahadith as it relates to the general principle, the general treatment of captives, male captives or female captives. And let's see what Islam and what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said about the treatment of captives and how we should behave towards them. The treatment of captives, narrated, and we're going straight to the hadith, narrated by Abu Dhar, anhu, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, feed those of your slaves who please you from what you eat and clothe them with what you clothe yourselves but sell those who do not please you and do not punish Allah's creatures and this is recorded by Abu Dawood so the Prophet Muhammad mentioned that if you have slaves and they're working for you and there's no problem with them then you feed them and you clothe them with the same way you feed and you clothe yourself this is the general treatment of those who become captives but if those who you do not you're not pleased with then you let them go 
you let them go. You don't sell them, but you let them go, and you do not punish them, um, because you should not punish the creatures of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Now, the issue is not about slavery, whether it's permissible or not. The issue is about his um, accusation against female slaves. But this is a general principle, because slavery did occur in the seventh century, and primarily we're talking about captive um, captive slavery, where people became slaves out of war and they became captives. This is what we're uh, discussing here. The hadith clearly tells us that if a slave woman does not uh, please her master, refuse to work for him, or allow him to lay down with her, the master is supposed to either bear patience with her or sell her. To sell her. Um, and this is um, this is the, the stipulation. Or he can let her go without there being any price uh, giving, if there was any uh, thing between the two. Um, the next one the unlawfulness to rape a slave girl according to the hadiths it says the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam made a decision about a man who had intercourse with his wife's slave as follows if he force her she is free and he shall and he shall give her mistress a slave girl similar to her because he took her uh, sexually out of force. So she has to be released free. And then he also have to compensate for the slave girl to the person who she belonged to. If she asks him to leave, have intercourse voluntarily, she will belong to him. She will belong to him. And he should give her mistress a slave girl similar to her. So now, if she voluntarily, willingly went into intimacy with the man... He becomes her right-hand possession. He has to be placed this uh, captive to the owner, and he can take her, and she becomes permissible uh, for him. And there's another hadith that we want to look at in terms of the exact treatment of them. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, it was narrated, that he who slaps his slave or beats him, the expiation for it is that he should set him free. When slapping a slave... Is such a heinous crime in a, in a in a house of Islam? How can one think that Islam would allow the raping of a slave woman? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, say if your person slaps or beats a slave, the compensation for that is to release the slave. They have to be released because you have no right to oppress anybody, and because of that oppression, they are set free. If the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying that you have to release them if you just slap them. How much more so if you take them physically without their consent? How much more so? And this is clear that what is called, um, it's, a, it's a principle that if, if, if one thing is permissible or forbidden, then something greater than that or something that's more severe than that, they also become forbidden, impermissible. Let us go, let us finish up his point here. For example, we read in the following hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood, volume 2, hadith number 2155. Abu Sa'id al Khudri narrated the Messenger of Allah, meaning Muhammad, sent a military expedition to Al Tas on the day of Hunayn, and they met their enemy, fought them, and defeated them. They took captives. فَكَأَنَّ أُنَاسًا مِنْ أَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ تَحَرَّجُوا مِنْ غِشْيَانِهِنَّ مِنْ أَجْلِ أَزْوَاجِهِنَّ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ But some of the companions of the Messenger of Allah were reluctant or felt uncomfortable to have relations, meaning sex, with them, meaning the female captives, because of their pagan husbands. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ فِي ذَلِكَ وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا مَا مَلَكَتْ أَيْمَانُكُمْ So Allah revealed the Quranic verse and forbidden are women already married except those whom your right hands possess. And this is again 
uh, Quran chapter 4, verse 24. As we so again, he's just mentioned another hadith that is given commentary on this particular ayat. We already verified the hadith that Sahih it has wording in Sahih Muslim. There's no uh, there's no issue about that. But the the, uh, the bone of contention here is that why is he not mentioning the fiqh application of this ayat as it relates to female captives? He mentioned nothing of the ahkam of the rules of fiqh about female captives and um, the permissibility of taking them uh, for right hand possessions. Why? This is commonly the case amongst these phobes and these people who are antagonists against Islam. They mention part and parcel of something to create a shock and awe, to create this uh, disturbance in you uh, after dressing up and say, oh wow, did it really say that? And then they bring a hadith and they read you a hadith and they bring an ayat and then we have people who don't understand the context to get all um, upset and confused and then they don't know what to do and um, how this is to be explained and then they end up leaving Islam. This may even be the case with him. He may have listened to people of the past, people who have television shows lying against Islam, bringing forth evidence like this without context. And because of that, now um, they're leaving Islam because of their ignorance. Let us finish this point here and then we want to go see some of the adilla, the proofs of about um, the uh, impermissibility of taking the woman against her will and the punishment for that. We said. أي فهن لهم حلال إذا أنقضت عدتهن meaning they are lawful or allowed for them when they complete their waiting period okay again now complete their waiting period so if they're having a waiting period why would there be a need, a need for a waiting period if the interest was just sexual if the men just wanted to take pleasure from these women and they were just considered to be as they call it sex slaves then why would they need to have an idda? why would they need to have a waiting period because a waiting period is just as a woman who becomes divorced she has a waiting period or a woman you know what I'm saying who um, is widowed they have a waiting period so like this Female captives also have a waiting period. Why? Because if they are afterwards taken by the um, the um, the Muslim to be their right hand possessions, then they're taken with the status of a, of a wife. They're taken to them with the status of a wife, and that's why that period is necessary to make any kind of reconciliation between the two uh, partners. She had a previous husband. She was taken as a captive of war. That marriage automatically was annulled once she became a captive. She has a waiting period. After her waiting period, if she consents, then they can be intimate with uh, the one who took her as a captive. And they, she has a status as a wife with him. And this hadith, my brothers and sisters, is sahih or authentic. So this hadith informs us that the Muslim soldiers had a problem. They wanted to have sex with the female captives, but these women were already married and they had husbands who were still living. So Muhammad then claims to receive a revelation from Allah. Muhammad then claims to receive a revelation from Allah. So as if somehow Muhammad is making this up to satisfy um, the people there. First and foremost, the fact that they had this concern shows that they had a type of uh, mannerism and morals with them that their husbands was existing there but we know that the ruling for taking uh, uh the ruling for a woman on the battlefield if she's a captive then she becomes a property of those who took her captive so the sahaba because of their morality they had a concern we we know she's legal for us to take as a captive and we know if she can sense she's legal for us also intimate intimate wise but their husbands are still alive how do we deal with this situation so they asked the prophet sallallahu and allah revealed this verse and then from this comes ahkam that their marriage is annulled once she becomes a captive she waits her idda and then after that they can take her as a, a right hand possession if she gives consent for intimacy and they move forward in those regards that instructs the Muslim men to wait for a period of time to ensure that the female captives are not pregnant and then after that period these Muslim men are allowed to go and have sex with these married women with their consent with their consent now let, let us look at that there <coughs> the earliest 
greatest imams of the ummah we have this question that comes up this is narrated by Imam Malik in his Muwatta he says Malik related to me from Ibn Shihab Ibn Shihab, Ibn Shihab is the great uh, hadith uh, compiler or uh, narrator Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri that Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan gave a judgment that the rapist had to pay the raped woman her bride price her dowry that Yahya said that he heard Malik say what is done in our community about the man who rapes a woman virgin or non-virgin if she is free is that he must pay the bride price the like of her if she is a slave he must pay what has what he has diminished of her worth and the had punishment in such cases is applied to the rapist and there is no punishment applied to that raped woman there is no punishment applied to her and if he raped her then the punishment is applied to him and that punishment is that he is stoned to death he is stoned to death that's the hard punishment for a person who commits adultery he is stoned to death so this is the ruling in Islam upon a person who rapes and this is also narrated by another scholar a student of, of, of Imam Malik by Ima, the name of Imam al-Shafi'i he has the same narration on the same position in his book called Al-Um in which he states that a person who rapes or takes from a woman her, her private um, forcefully without permission then he has to pay uh, a financial compensation and afterwards he is put to death for raping that woman captive or free whatever the case is so there there is no permissibility to rape in Islam moreover we ask the gentleman to bring one example from the history of Islam where we see any case where a Sahab or anybody raped a woman bring one case where we find that someone actually raped a woman and that it was tolerated and accepted we don't have it so these accusations that's made against Islam are lies that these people pr um, promote and propagate to create a shock and awe because they have something in their hearts so they want to try to create the same in other people's hearts but the proof is the proof and if you don't have the proof on your side then you are considered to be a liar if you're saying this is a case against Islam and we find no proof or justification for it let us let him continue and um, we're coming to a close here and we also want to bring some other um, um, relevant passages from the Bible showing uh, what's actually the stance of Christianity on um, female captives and rape. Now ask yourself this question. How would you feel if your wife or any woman in your family was captured by some enemy soldiers? then forced to divorce her husband, then forced to marry one of those enemy soldiers, then forced to have sex with that enemy soldier whom she obviously hated. Now you see again, I mean this is what, you know, he's, 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 hi he's hyping it up. He's drawing up the scenario that she's forced to divorce her husband and she's forced to marry this individual and she's forced to have sex. No, she's not forced in any of these situations. Because she becomes a captive of war, she becomes the property of the army that took her captive so anyone or no one has any claim over her anymore and if she had a husband then that marriage is annulled automatically next is that she's not forced to become a husband of anyone but she is a captive and she's not forced to have sex with anyone if she consents then she becomes the right hand possession of the one who took her captive if she doesn't then she just becomes a uh, captive and she remains that way until either she accepts to become right hand possession or the person may sell her uh, for a ransom whatever the case is and let us mention something very fast on this point at that time the women in that situation only had two options they were taken as captives so either they could be freed with no security, with no one there, because maybe the husbands were killed or the ex the husbands were executed uh, out of um, the the result of becoming captives or the like out of war, and then this woman has no protection, so she becomes 
a, 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 a war to society, she either can be harmed or accosted by anybody, or she can be taken and cared for, and someone can have responsibility over her. And this is what the Muslims done. Could you imagine that these women, all these women were let free, and now they're just roaming about with no husbands, no fathers, no family? What would happen to them? You may have other people, other brigands that may come in the cars and harm these women. But Islam gave this woman the opportunity to become a right-hand possession and obtain a status of a wife that's free in the household or in the jurisdiction of those, uh, those who took them captives. This is Islam practically dealing with a social reality that otherwise would have left these women in terrible conditions. Yet we have people like this one to come here and try to show blemish on the position of Islam uh, for that. And we have to ask, what is the position of Christianity for this kind of matter? What does Christianity say about taking captives, female captives, uh, out, out of war? What is the ruling in Christianity for that, my man? Please bring that for us in your response to this video. And all of this happened while her husband was still alive. Do you think that your wife, your sister, your daughter, or your mother would agree to have these things forced upon her in humiliation? Now remember this word humiliation because we're going to quote something uh, quickly uh, as it relates to humiliation. But I want to mention the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a young man came to him. And he asked the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Can you permit me to commit zina? Can you allow me to commit fornication? And the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said to the man, He said, Would you like that to be done to your mother? Would you like that to be done to your sister? Would you like that to be done to your daughter? And the man said, Of course not. He said, Well, then like that, no one else would like that to be done to their mother, or their sister, or their daughter. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, took his hand, his noble hand, and put it on the chest of the man, and he made dua for him. And the man said, from that point on, I never had a desire to go commit fornication ever again. This is the teaching of Islam. This is what Allah and His Messenger وسلم, has come to teach and instill in the people. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said that I was sent to perfect good and noble character in, in, in humanity. This is one of the reasons of why he came to humanity to instill and teach noble character. And in, in, in this day and time we have someone like this, uh, this profligate, um, bereft, uh, spiritually dead individual to come and try to lay blemish on the noble character of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam SubhanAllah This is, you know, ajeeb This is amazing How we have people bring it against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Something uh, that's not against him it, it reminds us of the hadith Where the people used to call the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam A name in Which means like the blameworthy And the Prophet Muhammad Peace be upon him said um, They say about the blameworthy but I'm not the blameworthy, rather I'm the praiseworthy. Meaning my character is praised by God and whoever they're calling is not me because this, this is not who I am. So we have people like this to come and say things against the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him when in actuality we know for sure his character is uh, exalted above any other that we have seen in the history of humanity. Uh, let him come to a close. We have about a ha uh, 30 seconds left and then we'll bring um, some other uh, points but let me let me bring this verse because he mentioned about humiliation. He mentioned about humiliation. Let us bring this verse from the Bible. Let us bring this verse from the Bible about female captives. In Deuteronomy 21 verses 10 to 14, it reads, When you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God hands them over to you, and you take them captive, suppose you see amongst the captives a beautiful woman whom you desire. And want to marry and so you bring her home to your house she shall have she shall shave her head pair her nails discard her captives garb and shall remain in your house a full month mourning for her father and mother after that you may go into her and be her husband and she shall be your wife but if you are not satisfied with her you should let her go free 
and should not sell her for money. You must not treat her as a slave since you have dishonored her. So the Bible says, this is what the Bible says, the position of the Bible as it relates to female captives. Something to think about. Let me finish up and then we'll bring some other uh, relevant verses from the Bible. Uh, something uh, refuting this um, from Islam and then we are close. No sane person in his or her right mind could defend the Quran and Muhammad on this issue. This is nothing more than legalized rape of married women. So again, I mean, we mentioned about rape in Islam. We brought the proof from the scholars. We brought the proof from the Hadith uh, about rape. So why would this gentleman consider this to be rape? Either out of his ignorance or out of his uh, arrogance um, that he's presenting such an argument. And I cannot believe that this is from God. So, so he cannot believe that this is from God. We clarified the matter. We brought the uh, necessary proofs. And we also showed a verse from the Bible. And we're going to show a couple more verses from the Bible. Um, because at the end of his talk, he says, Amen. Indicating or uh, lending to the idea that maybe he has taken now a Christian orientation. So if you take a Christian orientation and accept the Bible uh, as the word of God and wants to follow the Bible, then he has to explain these similar parallel uh, realities that occur in the Bible that he is blaming Islam for. And let us get to that. So, therefore, I am rejecting the Quran and Muhammad on this issue. Therefore, he is rejecting Muhammad and the Quran on this issue. So we have to ask, will you also reject the Bible and the beliefs of the church on this issue as well? Now you have some idea why I left Islam. And in the coming videos, I hope to share more reasons with you. Because and in the coming videos, we will be there to refute uh, any claims that you make against Islam as we have refuted you here and as we will close our refutation shortly with some verses uh, from the Bible as well as some statements from non-Muslim historians on the aspect of uh, captive captivity amongst females in Islam. As there are many. Thank you for watching and may God bless you and me and us all. Amen. Alright, so there we have it. So now let us go in closing uh, to uh, some verses in the Bible as it relates uh, to this matter. And then we'll do a recap and close the video as we're getting over the 40 minute mark. Okay. Murder, rape, and pillage of the Midianites. In Numbers, is this where we want to begin here? Let's see. We want to go up here, actually, not numbers, but we want to go to Judges. And we want to read this passage here. It says, So they sent 12,000 warriors to Jabesh uh, Gilead with orders to kill everyone there, including women and children. This is what you are to do, they said. Completely destroy all the males and every woman who is not a virgin. Let us stop here. Every woman who is not a virgin. How will they know that she's not a virgin? That's an interesting question, right? Among the residents of Jabesh Gilead, they found 400 young virgins who had never slept with a man, and they brought them to the camp of Shiloh in the land of Canaan. The Israelite assembly sent a peace delegation to the little remnants of Benjamin, Benjamin who were living at the rock of the Rimmon. Then the men of Benjamin returned to their homes and the 400 women of Jabez Gilead who were spared were given to them as wives but there were not enough women for all, all, of, the, all of them there wasn't enough women for all of the men the people felt sorry for Benjamin because the Lord had left this gap in the tribes of, of Israel so the Israel leaders asked how can we find wives for the few who remain since all of the women of the tribe of Benjamin are dead. There must be hairs for the survivors so that an entire tribe of Israel will not be lost forever. But we cannot give them our own daughters in marriage because we have sworn with a solemn oath that anyone who does this will fall under God's curse. 
Listen to this. Then they thought of the annual festival of the Lord held in Shiloh between Lebanon and Bethel along the east side of the road that goes from Bethel to Sheshem. They told the men of Benjamin who still needed wives, Go and hide in the vineyards. When the women of Shiloh come out for their dances, rush out from the vineyards and each of you can take one of them home to be your wife. And when their fathers and brothers come to us in protest, we will tell them, please be understanding. Let them have your daughters, for we didn't find enough wives for them. We didn't find enough wives for them. When we destroyed, when we destroyed Jebus Gilead, and you are not guilty of breaking the vow, since you did not give your daughters in marriage to them. So the men of Benjamin did as they were told. They kidnapped. They kidnapped. They kidnapped the women who took part in the celebration and carried them off to the land of their own inheritance. They kidnapped them and they carried them off to their homes. Then they rebuilt their towns and lived in them. So the assembly of Israel departed by tribes and families and they returned to their own homes. This is what the Bible says about taking captives uh, and when there was a shortage of them they hide behind the bush they ambush the people and they took them home um, without their consent this is what the Bible says about ca captives in war is this not rape is this not rape now let's see actually what the Bible says about rape in closing the law of rape the law of rape if a man is caught in the act of raping a young woman who is not engaged, he must pay 50 pieces of silver to her father. Then he must marry the young woman because he violated her. And he will never be allowed to divorce her. <laughs> well, if a man is caught in the act of raping a young woman who is not engaged, he must pay 50 pieces of silver to her father. Then he must marry the young woman because he violated her. And he would never be allowed to divorce her ever. This is what the Bible says about rape. So actually the victim. The victim that's being raped. Not only is being raped. But then has to suffer the, the penalty of being wedded to the, 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 the rapist forever of his life. This is what the Bible says about rape. In closing, let us look at some statements from non-Muslims as relates to the idea of female captivity in Islam and how just a system that Islam brought uh, opposed to the lies and propagation that we hear uh, from the gentleman uh, and his like. The non-Muslim perspective on the attitude of Muslim masters with their slaves, Wilm Durant, he says, he handled them with a gen genuine, uh, genuine humanity that made their lot no worse, perhaps better, as more secure than that of a factory worker in 19th century Europe. This is what Will Durant said about the idea of female captivity in Islam. At the end of the 18th century, uh, Moragdia, Oh, son, a main source of information for the Western writers on the Ottoman Empire declared, There is perhaps no nation where the captives, the slaves, the very toilers, and the galleys are better provided for or treated with more kindness than amongst the Mohammedans. Than amongst the Mohammedans. Another quote, Pierre Riviere, he writes, a master was enjoined to make his slaves share the bounties he received from God. It must be recognized that in this respect, the Islamic teaching acknowledged such a respect for human personality and showed a sense of equality which is searched for in a vain and ancient civilization. And we can go on and on and on. The videos get long. But we see that non-Muslims, they are complimenting and congratulating the position of Islam on captivity and taking uh, the people as slaves, whether they be male 
or female. This is what we wanted to bring. In closing, we want to do a recap and mention it about the conditions of those who in the right hand possession, possession, uh, possessions. This is what Islam says about it. First and foremost, automatically the woman becomes divorced from her husband if she is taken as a captive. So anyone that takes her uh, as a right hand possession and enjoys her uh, sexually, then the marriage that she had with her previous husband is automatically annulled and he's not sleeping with a married woman. Secondly, uh, intimacy can only occur through her consent. Intimacy can only occur through her consent. Thirdly, once this intimacy occurs, this captive has her status has been raised to that of a wife. The man is responsible for her. He's responsible to protect her. He's responsible to provide for her. He's responsible for her well-being all across the board. So it's not just a matter of sex uh, that's in, uh, involved here, but actually she enjoys the same status as that of a free woman that he's married to. Fourth, the well treatment is a must. We read the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him stated that you have to treat them well and if you harm them or physically abuse them then the compensation is to set them free because of the transgressions that occurred against them. Five, forced sex rape is prohibited in Islam. And any man that forces himself upon any woman, any captive, any free one, then he has to give them a monetary stipulation and the punishment for adultery is applied upon that man. Six, we mentioned that if uh, the person, the slave, uh, is physically abused, then they also have to be freed uh, from captivity um, because of the abuse that the man gave to uh, that um, that particular slave uh, under their lot. So we see that these proofs from Islam show that this individual that we have here is lying against Islam. Islam does not in any way condone, permit, encourage rape. It is not encourage uh, sex with women who their husbands um, are, are present but rather because the, the marriage is annulled, then that woman becomes the property of the person that took her captive. Islam does not, the Quran does not, the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam does not encourage any such behavior. Uh, and this is this, the, the fascinations of this man's mind and those who think like him. But we brought our proof, we refuted it, and we hope that this is enough uh, to warrant a response from him and to warrant a response of apology from him by being ignorant of the facts, now being educated, and come back and recant what you said against Islam that was untrue. Hadha wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sabbi wa sallam subhanaka lahum wa bihamdika ashadu ala ila la'ant astaghfiruka wa tubu alaik wa salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh we apologize for the video being so long but we wanted to cover these points as they are crucial and we needed to refute this uh, if you stuck to the end we, we, we thank you for writing it out to the end and we ask you to pass this on um, again pardon us for the, the long um, the long um, win um, refutation but we need to do what we have to do to refute the people like this and we see you next time leave your comments uh, subscribe if you have not and pass it on and see you in the next video.